Well, I described my history, which was high yield bonds in 78, distressed debt in 88, emerging markets in 98. So uh, the key is that there were people, things people would do and things people wouldn't do. There were markets that people didn't understand, didn't have full data on. Maybe there wasn't any performance history. Uh, the, the markets were not fully, they didn't have the infrastructure and the institutions. Um, and of course, there were biases, as I described. There were people who said, no, it's, you know, Moody's, venerable credit rating institution. If you took down the 1978 edition of the Moody's Manual off your shelf, and you looked up the definition of a B-rated bond, it said, fails to possess the characteristics of a desirable investment. In other words, you cannot prudently invest in a B-rated bond. That's a bias, and when, if there's an asset, and 99% of people will not buy it at any price, then it makes sense that the people who will buy it might get a bargain. So these things, not knowing about it, not understanding about it, not being willing to buy it, not thinking it's, it's a professional or fiduciary, these are the kinds of things that create inefficiency, what I call structural inefficiency. Where are they today? Almost negligible. Today, you know, the, the, believe me, 40, 50 years ago, for those of you who were not practicing this profession then, the world was a stupid place. Nobody knew anything. I mean, there was all this data, and maybe the data existed, or maybe it didn't exist, but if it existed, maybe it was over there, and maybe you were over there, and you had no idea where it was, or how to get it, or the people who had it wouldn't give it to you. And today, everybody knows everything. You know, you're out to dinner with your date or your spouse, and you have an argument about when a certain movie came out, you Google it, you find out. Everybody, there's no such thing anymore as not knowing anything. And so, if today, everybody knows about every asset class, has data on it, and feels they understand it and feels comfortable with it, then where are you going to find structural inefficiencies? And the answer is, it's tough. It's really tough. And so, in my opinion, uh, I wrote a memo in January of 14 called Getting Lucky. By the way, all the memos, unlike the book, the, the memos are available free. I highly recommend that. And they're all available at uh, www.oaktreecapital.com under click on insights, and you'll see a thing there about the chairman's memos, or maybe it says memos from Howard Marks. But, um, so I wrote this memo called uh, Getting Lucky. And uh, I talked about a process I call efficientization, which is if inefficiency is really, the, to sum it up and oversimplify it, inefficiency is the result of ignorance. And today, there's much less ignorance. So markets become more efficient over time, and I believe most markets have become more efficient over time. And it's very hard to find anything uh, that is uh, about which there is ignorance. And by the way, back in 1978, people would say to me, well, young man, and I was a young man at the time, I'm sure you can make a lot of money doing that, but it wouldn't be proper. It wouldn't be fiduciary. Mm -hmm. Now, look around this room. Today, anybody will do anything to make a buck. <laughs> so that bias does not exist. And that's the bias that gave people like me opportunity 40 years ago. And if nobody's, if everybody's willing to, you know, the, the economists, we talk about efficient markets. The economy talks about perfect markets. Economists talk about it. And there are certain criteria for perfect markets, which are obviously the same. And one is knowledge, one is objectivity, and one is the willingness to substitute. So in other words, oil and gas will be priced in a standard relationship to each other as long as everybody is willing and able to go from oil to gas and gas to oil. They will equilibrate their prices. That's what efficient markets do, and today, people are willing to invest in any market. So it's really hard to think of, of where you're gonna get a free lunch. Um, however, I do go on in the memo to say that while structural inefficiency is hard to locate, from time to time we get cyclical inefficiency, which is to say from time to time people lose their objectivity and they value 
assets too low, in which case we can get bargains if we resist the error of their psychology. And sometimes they like assets too much, and the prices are too high, and we can make easy money by shorting them if we can resist the error of, of the common psychology. So I think it's really hard to get, find structural inefficiency today. From time to time, we find cyclical inefficiency. And I can't tell you where the dividing line is, and it's, it's never the same. And by the way, one of my, I'll say, competitors uh, came out with a very clever s statement th about four years ago. He said, everything with the QSIP is overpriced today. So what he was saying is that all public securities are overpriced because they're too easy to invest in. So, but but, but uh, by implication, private investments are not overpriced. Um, but if everybody hears that and everybody responds and everybody dumps their public securities and buys in the private markets, then maybe the inflow of capital from the private markets makes the private invest to the private markets makes private investments too expensive and their desertion of the public market makes those too cheap. So these, there's no uh, rule that always stands. And when everybody says the secret to getting rich, the secret to superior risk-adjusted returns is to make private investments, if everybody believes it and all the money flows to private investments, then it will no longer be underpriced and attractive. <laughs>